Samavetta, Bhakti Vindiki Jai. Yeah. Go, Premanandi. Yeah. All glories to assemble the bodies. Yeah. All glories to assemble the bodies. All glories to assemble the bodies. Yeah. All glories to Sri Guru and Sri Guranga. All glories to Sri Prabhupada. Namo yeah. Vishnu Badaya, Krishna Prashaya Bhutale, Shimate, Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Niti Namane, yeah. Namaste, Saraswata Deve, Gauravani Pracharane. Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pashachadesha Tarane Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nichananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shuas Digor Bhakti Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So the major part of Harinam Shantamani is taken up with a discussion of the uh, ten Nam Aparad. So Bhakti Vinod Thakur uh, dedicates one chapter for each of the Aparads. After that he also lifts the Seva Aparads, but he doesn't discuss them in detail. Uh, and then he gives a whole uh, padati of Raghunuga Bhakti. <laughs> That's how you get your sarups <laughs> and you meditate on your uh, Siddha form, etc. Uh, so I'll just uh, cover the Aparads, the Das Aparads, the ten Nam Aparads here. Uh, they're considered to be the most serious of the Aparads. Huh? So, included in these Aparads, uh, we have some concerning devotees, some concerning the process of bhakti, uh, different uh, groups of Aparads. So, uh, the first two uh, uh, will be concerning devotees. So, the very first one is called Sadhu Ninda which is literally criticizing the devotee 
about the offense it's not necessarily criticizing many other things actions as well or even thinking badly of devotees uh, but uh, what does the word sadhu mean uh, uh, who is a sadhu who is a devotee huh? so that we should define very nicely uh, so uh, as far as the Vaishnava is concerned uh, we do have many lists of uh, qualities for the devotee who is a Vaishnava who is a devotee uh, but we should understand that the main quality is uh, surrender to Krishna all other qualities are there but if there's no surrender to Krishna he's not a devotee <laughs> So that's the main uh, aspect of uh, sadhu. Huh? Uh, and when we distinguish this devotee as being surrendered, uh, we don't consider him in terms of material designations, uh, um, which ca may cause offense. Huh? This can be a, a sadhu ninda if we consider the material aspects of the Vaishnava and we don't get the surrender part of it. Huh? Uh, so technically, um, varna and ashrama, good qualities are part of material world. Uh, and the better part is the sattva gun part, and then the raja gun and tama part are the lesser uh, parts of the uh, material world. So uh, if we, we can criticize a person for all these uh, different material aspects. However, uh, we, we're looking, not looking at that, we're looking at the surrender of the devotee. That's the main element. And that is independent of anything in the material world. Huh? So we should not uh, think of the devotee in terms of uh, these things, like varna. Hmm? So, uh, in, in, of course, in the varnas, we have higher varnas and lower varnas. The higher the varna, the more the sattva. The lower the varna, the more tamas. Huh? So generally, we say, hey, it's better to have higher varna than lower varna. But um, often the, the varna consideration is not only the gunas, but also simply the birth. Huh? So if we only relate, judge the, uh, the devotee based on his birth in a Brahmin family or a Sudra family, that is considered to be uh, offense. Huh? Huh? So we have to look at the actual qualities, not simply a varna. Uh, ashrama again, uh, we, we shouldn't think in terms of ashrama, uh, which is a better ashrama. Huh? Now actually in scripture we'll see that generally the uh, grihasa is considered to be uh, the, the, the main type of devotee and, and the grasas are usually the gurus also. <laughs> huh? uh, but uh, a devotee can be in, on any level, he could be a sannyasi, he could be a brahmachari, a grihasa or a vanaprasa, it doesn't matter. Uh, so we should not consider ashram uh, and, and consider the, you know, criticize the devotee because he's got some wrong ashram or whatever. Age also. Uh, we may consider a, a devotee s uh, better because he's older. Uh, uh, but, of course, that's, that's one consideration that the person who's older should have more experience. <laughs> if he's been a devotee for, you know, <laughs> 20 years, he should have more devotion than a devotee who's been a devotee for one year. But sometimes it doesn't work that way also. Uh, uh, we can't, and if it's simply age, in terms of age, we cannot judge a person. Um, for instance, Sukadev was very young, but uh, everyone worshipped him. Uh, even Narada Muni worshipped him when he came into the assembly of Pariksha Maharaj. But he was very young. So we can't uh, judge a, a devotional advancement based on age and strength or health of the body again. Uh, uh, that is not a consideration, or beauty, what the person looks like, or the wealth of the person. That doesn't determine their status as a devotee, or the number of followers they got. That also doesn't determine the status of the devotee. <laughs> uh, so we, we, when we uh, see the devotees, we can't judge them in terms of uh, these things. Huh? Uh, furthermore, um, all the devotees are going through stages from Shraddha, to prema. Now, if they have prema, then of course there is no karmas, there is no anartas at all. So you cannot criticize them for anything. <laughs> uh, but all the other devotees still have anartas, even into bhava stage. So what do we do? We we 
we can see the anarchists, so we should not criticize those anarchists. <laughs> huh? There may be what we call traces of sin or karma or so many things in the devotees. But the understanding is that through bhakti, if it is performed properly, uh, then all those anarthas will disappear. Hmm? So as we go through the different stages from faith all the way to prema, uh, we start out with a little attraction to the Lord. But as we go through the stages, gradually that increases. That's the pink section there. Huh? And uh, the, we start out with a lot of anarthas and a little bit of bhakti. But as we progress, the bhakti increases and the anarthas decrease. Hmm? natural. Uh, but uh, and then of course we have aparads which may continue even into the bhava stage as I mentioned the other night. So uh, all, in all these stages of prema there are going to be some anarta or some aparad or something there. Uh, so the traces will be there. Uh, so we don't unnecessarily criticize the devotees uh, because uh, they're not perfect. <laughs> hmm? So, we're looking for that main quality, that is the surrender. And they may have anarthas or whatever, but we understand that they're progressing in bhakti, and those anarthas will disappear gradually. Hmm. Uh, so, the real devotee surrenders to the Lord, and he also appreciates the other devotees. Uh, so, if we're a devotee, then we should appreciate the other devotees and not look at the faults and criticize the Vaishnavas. Huh? Uh, as I said, they, they, do, may, they may have faults. It's true because they're going through an art and liberty, but uh, still, uh, we don't unnecessarily uh, criticize those faults because we understand they're going to be uh, eventually annihilated. So the devotee has a special position. Uh, if we look in the scriptures, we see that uh, the association of devotees is always praised as being the, the source of faith and the source of bhakti and uh, sadhu sangha is always advised in the advancement of bhakti, so very, very important. And in fact, in Chaitanya Shatamrita, uh, there Lord Chaitanya says you should take the foot water and the foot dust and the food, the mahaprasadam maha of the devotee. Uh, that is uh, very, very um, uplifting for a, a devotee. So we respect the devotees uh, greatly. And what is the reason for that? The reason is that uh, the devotee has Krishna Shakti. And this is the usual way in which Krishna spreads his mercy in this world through the devotees. So if you offend the devotees, we don't get the mercy and then nothing happens. Huh? So, uh, the, uh, the devotee is the medium for uh, Krishna's Shakti to manifest in this world. Uh, and therefore, we have to give respect to the devotee. If we give the proper respect, uh, then that, that Shakti from uh, the devotee can spread to the next devotee. If, if we don't give respect, nothing is going to happen. Huh? In other words, by disrespecting devotees, we cut off our relationship with the mercy of the Lord. So we have to respect the devotees. So, um, Ninda, uh, criticism. So we can criticize a devotee f but for his low birth. Yeah. Uh, we can criticize a devotee for previous sinful activities before he became a devotee. Mm. We can criticize the devotee for uh, Traces, a little bit traces of uh, sinful activity. Yeah? Uh, uh, we can criticize the devotee for an accidental sin. He, 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 after he became a devotee, he committed a sin, but he corrected himself. Huh? So uh, to unnecessarily criticize like this is not proper. Huh? And the result of this is that uh, we are cut off from that mercy of the Lord. Huh? Uh, there could be many other types of ninda as well, but these are some of them. Huh? Not like that. So, uh, by uh, the aparad, eventually the, the, the flow of bhakti uh, from Krishna to the devotee to the other devotee is, is cut. And, and we can't advance in devotional service because of that. Huh? Uh, so, we find in uh, Bhagavad Gita 
in chapter 9, uh, then Krishna talks about uh, the uh, sudur achara, uh, one who's committed a very sinful activity uh, as a devotee. Uh, so then Krishna says, even if one commits the most abominable action, if he's engaged in devotional service, he is to be considered saintly because he is properly situated in his determination. Uh, so Krishna does not mm, disregard the devotee even if he commits a sinful activity. He still gives him respect. And he says, you should respect also that devotee. Yeah. So because Krishna respects, we should respect as well. Yeah. Uh, so that we don't count that sinful activity against that devotee. Yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, Vishnu Chakravarti goes to great lengths to, uh, in his purport to uh, uh, say that you uh, you know, you have to respect that devotee, uh, by all means. Uh, I won't get into the commentary, but anyway. So, uh, why would we criticize devotees? Uh, generally, it is because of association with asat people. Hmm? So, asat uh, means... Uh, one, associating with women outside of marriage, associating with a person who associates with women outside of marriage, <laughs> uh, association with uh, non-devotees like mayavadis, uh, pretenders, uh, atheists, worshippers of devatas, etc., uh, sinful people, etc. This is all asat sangha. Huh? So, if we associate with these type of people, uh, then uh, we could criticize the Vaishnavas. Huh? Of course, we could have many other apparatus as well, but this is one of them that could result huh? from this association with the um, Asat people. Hmm? Uh, so, what is that association? It is not simply coming near a person. It's where there is this intimate relationship established. Huh? So we saw, uh, we see in Nectar of Instruction there, it says there are six exchanges, giving and receiving knowledge or uh, gifts or food with affection. <laughs> so when we establish affectionate relationships and exchange like that, that is what a Sangha is. If it's with devotees, very good, then it's Sat Sangha, and that's how we can relate with devotees. But if it's with materialists, then it becomes Asat Sangha, that um, dealing with affection between a devotee and uh, uh, another person. Huh? So the Asat Sangha is that intimate dealing with the person. And if we do that then, we can get influence. We get influence, then we will not respect the devotees properly. Yeah. Uh, so therefore we emphasize that we should have good association, not bad association. Huh? Uh, there's the example given in the Nectar Devotion. I think I mentioned it there also. I use the example of the crystal. So the crystal is colorless. But if we put it near a red flower, then it looks red. We put it near a blue flower, it looks blue. If we put it near a yellow flower, it looks yellow. <laughs> so if a person goes near a sinful person, then he'll pick up the <laughs> sinful nature of that person. We put him near a, a devotee, then he'll start to pick up the nature of a devotee. So this is just the... Mm, let's say the 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 quality of uh, human beings that they they very easily pick up the qualities of the person they associate. But association means that uh, affectionate relationship that is established. Then they can pick up those qualities easy. So therefore, the wise person must choose very carefully who he associates with. Huh? Uh, so this can be a cause of advancement. Or it can be a, a cause of degradation, our choice of association or sangha. Huh? So, we have the three types of devotees mentioned in the Bhagavatam. The Kanishta is the lowest, uh, who has little faith in the Lord, uh, no knowledge, very little knowledge, chants Namabhas. He does not associate with devotees. He only worships the Lord in the temple. And consequently, he'll associate with non-devotees. 
So this person is not in a very good position. <laughs> so say so non devotees, then he may commit sadhurinda or something like that. Eh? The Madhyama devotee uh, is in a much better position because he has knowledge, sambandagyan. He uh, recognizes the value of devotee association and he serves the superior devotees. He associates uh, in a friendly manner with equal devotees and he gives instructions to the uh, lower devotees. Uh, he avoids the asat sangha. Uh, he chants constantly sudanam uh, and he avoids namaparats including sadhu ninda. He can distinguish the Vaishnava from the non Vaishnava and he distinguishes the different levels of Vaishnava. So this person is very are uh, capable of advancing nicely in devotional service. Yeah? This is the person who associates with devotees and values that association. And he also understands the danger of sadhu ninda, uh, criticizing the Vaishnava. Uh, so he is uh, well situated to advance in devotional service. Uh -huh. His association with the devotees is like this, friendly with equals, serves to superiors, gives mercy to Kanishtas, and he avoids the non-devotees. Uh, the Uttama devotee no longer makes distinctions between devotees and non-devotees. <laughs> he sees Krishna everywhere. He's realized someone again. He's uh, relishing the holy name. Uh, uh, he cannot con commit namaparads or anything. Uh, so he's in a very different position from everyone else, uh, but definitely he's not going to commit uh, sadhu ninda. Huh? So this is a very high Vaishnava. Huh? Uh, so this type of devotee is very rare, and uh, we may not even recognize them. So we have to be very careful in associating with others that we respect all living entities because we not, may not even recognize the Uttamadikari. Uh, we may think he's a beggar on the street. <laughs> so we have to be very, very careful. Huh? Hmm? Ah, so this devotee sees everything in relation to the Lord um, out of uh, ecstasy. Huh? Uh, and everything is somehow related to the Lord, like the trees and the rivers, etc. We have the example of the gopis, for instance. They look at the trees and they see the trees serving Krishna by offering their fruits. Uh, they see the river offering lotuses to Krishna's feet, etc. So they, everything's in terms of Krishna. Huh? Ah. Okay, so if we have sadhu ninda or criticizing the Vaishnavas, what should we do? Uh, so we have to repent and we have to get the forgiveness of the uh, devotee. So that's the standard procedure. And if we avoid that, uh, then the offense gets worse. <laughs> if there's no possibility of going to the devotee for some reason, then all we can do is take resort of the holy name and keep continual chanting to get rid of that offense. Huh? Uh, but this is called the mad elephant offense. So if it's uh, a serious offense is being committed, it can destroy or weaken the bhakti to a very great degree. So we have to be very careful of this offense. Hmm? Okay. So, this is actually the third, but I put this next because it's also uh, a devotee, a Vaishnava Parad. So that's Guru or Avagya, disrespect to the Guru. So the Guru is also a sadhu, a devotee. Uh, so whatever applies for sadhu ninda also applies to Guru. But then we, when we use the word Guru, we usually mean there's a special relationship with the Guru. Huh? Uh, rather than uh, just a general devotee. Right? So there's two functions. One is the uh, guru who gives the mantra. Uh, so that person is defined as the diksha guru. Uh, uh, and then we have uh, the uh, person who gives spiritual instructions. It's called the shiksha guru. Uh, so the, the, what is the qualification of the guru? Uh, Again, like the devotee, surrender to Krishna. We don't look at the bodily considerations of varna, ashrama, age, whatever, money, followers, etc. 
it's surrender to Krishna is what we're judging on. Hmm? Uh, so the person could be a Brahmana, Vaishya, Kshatri, Sudra, Brahmachari, Grihasta, Vanaprasa, Sanyasa, it doesn't matter. Uh, the main thing is that surrender to the Lord. And so that person has the ability to guide another person to surrender. Hmm? The only rule regarding um, ashram, we can say, is the uh, that a renunciate should give to a renunciate. In other words, a sannyasi gives sannyas. <laughs> Uh, a grihasa should not give sannyas to a person. That's natural. Uh, so the Diksha Guru, uh, you can only accept one Diksha Guru. So you get one mantra or one set of mantras. We don't go around collecting mantras from different gurus. <laughs> huh? In other words, we're supposed to dedicate ourselves to one type of worship, a one form of the Supreme Lord, not start you know, trying to worship everybody. <laughs> huh? uh, Diksha Guru should also have knowledge of the Sampradaya, the teachings of the Sampradaya, and should have good conduct. Shiksha Guru, uh, you can have many Shiksha Gurus, and uh, they give instructions, philosophical instructions, instructions on, on bhakti, etc. Huh? Uh, and uh, we can put all devotees who are preaching in the category of shiksha guru, uh, but uh, usually the term is used in scripture to indicate um, a person, a guru, uh, with uh, which one has a rather special relationship in terms of teaching, not just all. Uh, people who are, t uh, you know, giving preaching or whatever. Huh? Uh, so they may go to that person for special instructions and, uh, and establish a special relationship. Uh, and uh, the Shiksha Guru and the Diksha Guru should be worshipped equally. Uh, we also have, uh, under the Shiksha Guru category, the Acharyas. So they're in a special uh, category. We have acharyas who found the sampradaya, uh, and then after that we get the uh, the direct followers of the uh, person who found the sampradaya. Huh? Uh, so they're put in a special category of shiksha guru. Uh, so one, if one is in the sampradaya, we have to follow the teachings of that founder uh, and remain loyal to those instructions, mm -hmm. and, and not go outside the sampradaya. So, as I said, uh, the Shiksha Guru and the Diksha Guru both get equal respect. Uh, dear servants of the Lord, uh, they serve, we serve uh, uh, that Guru with great devotion. In the mm, Chaitanya Chaitamrita, among the first ten items is uh, take uh, Diksha and Shiksha. And then the next element is serve the Guru with great respect. <laughs> So, uh, and then the, the first one was uh, Guru Parasraya, take shelter of the lotus feet of Guru. So, uh, Rupa Goswami says these are the three most important ones. So, emphasis is put upon the Guru and the respect of the Guru. Uh, and uh, in terms of deity worship, we worship the Guru before we worship Krishna. Hmm. So, uh, uh, we should respect the Guru. Uh, we can do that by various types of services. Uh, so one uh, respects his seat, his shoes, his bed, his water, his shadow, etc. Uh, one follows his instructions, very important. Uh, offer uh, pranamas on the ground. <laughs> uh, say his name with respect. Uh, try to please him in all ways. Uh, chant uh, the holy name under his instruction, etc. So. Uh, this, these are the general types of service and respect we give to the Guru. So it could be Shiksha Guru or Diksha Guru. Mm. Bhakti Thakur also covers the subject of rejection of Guru. So generally, uh, we, we, don't, we can't reject the Guru because then it would be offense. Huh? But if the Guru becomes unqualified, then what do we do? Uh, uh, so this may happen. Uh, so Bhaktivan Thakur explains by uh, Asat Sangha, a guru may lose his qualification. Uh, and then uh, he commits namaparads of some sort, and then he loses his taste for chanting and for bhakti. So then he's no longer qualified as a guru. Uh, uh, 
he becomes hostile to the Vaishnavas, etc. Uh, may fall into sinful activity. So, uh, how can we respect him then as a guru if that happens? Huh? Huh? Uh, so, if he's in an incurable fallen state, then one would have to reject the person. If we don't reject him, then it is said that you get dragged down also. <laughs> You're still devoted to a person who's doing sinful activity, then genuinely also become sinful. So you would have to reject that person at that point. Huh? Ah, and uh, since we don't have a guru, then we take shelter of another uh, great devotee. Hmm? So, uh, yeah, and if we don't reject, then we get problems also. Uh, um, Bhakti Nautakura says, therefore, before choosing a guru, you should be very careful and see that he is a genuine Vaishnava. <laughs> uh, um, of course, in um, India, um, yeah, traditionally, uh, in, even 500 years ago, whatever, uh, there was no organizations as such. This individuals <laughs> doing their own thing everywhere, <laughs> temples and devotees maybe here, or there, whatever, in different groups doing something, but no real uh, well-organized uh, society or whatever. So uh, therefore one would have to be very careful about who one's accepting because uh, there's so many people, there's so many choices, who, who do we choose? And, but then you have to study very carefully uh, ahead of time to see what their philosophy is, uh, see how they're acting with others, etc. So uh, one has to be very careful uh, in choosing guru. Huh? So uh, this uh, guru or vagya means disrespect to the guru. So uh, what would the disrespect consist of? Uh, we may reject him or disobey him uh, when uh, he shouldn't be rejected. So that would be considered to be an offense. We give him up uh, and we get another Diksha Guru, for instance, but he didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> so that's considered to be offensive. Huh? Uh, we may not follow his instructions. Uh, and then again, the problem is there. Uh, so, uh, when uh, this Gora Vagya takes place, we have to be very uh, careful to somehow counter that. Huh? Um, so what is the remedy? Ultimately, uh, we have to repent for it, realize our mistake, and go to the Guru and ask for forgiveness. And just as with the uh, uh, Sadhunin, huh? go to the person, apologize. and. Uh, uh, continually chant the holy name. Huh? Okay, do another one. Uh, so, um, the second offense is to consider the names of devatas like Brahma and Shiva to be equal to the of the name of Lord Vishnu. So it's concerning the name, but ultimately it means even our concept of who's who. We have to get straight, and if we don't, then it's aparad. <laughs> uh, so, uh, we shouldn't consider the Lord to be a devata. Hmm? And therefore his name is not the same or equal to the devata's names. Hmm? So uh, we have a very simple um, hierarchy. <laughs> we have Supreme Lord at the top, uh, Vishnu or Krishna or any of the avatar forms. Huh? Uh, so this, uh, the Lord is independent. Nobody is above him. And uh, we have qualities. Krishna 64, Vishnu is 60. So that, the 60 and 64, that's Supreme Lord. Huh? Shiva has 55 qualities. So we distinguish Shiva from Vishnu by the five qualities. Uh, so we cannot equate them. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these forms of the Lord are eternally manifest in the spiritual world, always perfect, never influenced by Maya. Shiva uh, is in a very special position. He's not a Jiva, like the other Devatas, but at the same time, 
uh, he only manifests 55 qualities, so therefore we cannot say he's equal. <laughs> we can call him Ishvara, uh, Lord, but he's not in the same position as Vishnu because he lacks five qualities. Mm -hmm. Among those qualities, one is uh, that the Lord emanates all the universes from the pores of his body as Mahavishnu. So Shiva doesn't do that. He's not the creator. Another one is that the Lord produces all the avatar forms that enter into the material world. And so Shiva doesn't do that either. So these are two qualities that uh, Shiva doesn't have. So therefore we distinguish Shiva from Vishnu. They're not exactly the same. Right, Shiva. And then we have other devatas. Most of these devatas are jivas. So uh, they are quite different. The uh, jivas are small particles, uh, little uh, uh, like um, photons or something, little particles of consciousness. And the Lord is not little particle. He's vibhu. He's big. He's all pervading consciousness. Yeah. So the jivas can get a little bit of 50 qualities of the Lord. So they're quite different from Supreme Lord. Uh, the David doesn't get a little bit more than that. <laughs> yeah. uh, and they're all, the jivas are all servants of the Supreme Lord. Yeah. Uh, when they're in the material world, then as jivas, they take up material bodies. Whereas the Lord never has a material body. So therefore we can't equate... Uh, Supreme Lord with the Devatas at all. Uh, to do so is a misunderstanding and an upper on. So, we have some misconceptions that arise. Um, um, one is that um, uh, we'll think that the name of the Lord and the Lord are different. Huh? Uh, we say, on the other hand, the Lord is the same as his name. Non-different, but if we say they're different, this actually means that we, it's like a material name. Mm. We have an object and then we have a name for it, but this, the name is obviously different from the object. It's not the same thing, it's just a sound. <laughs> so if we think that the sound Krishna is different from Krishna, uh, it's just a, like a material a designation, then that is also offense. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, um, mm, when we do this, we're also thinking the Lord himself has a material body like everyone else. <laughs> everyone has material bodies and they also have material names. And think of the Lord in the same way. Mm -hmm. uh, Another thing is to uh, just equate the Lord with the David. Uh, whatever the, we think of David is, then we see Vishnu or Krishna is the same as that. If we think that David is a Jiva, we'll also think that Vishnu is a Jiva. <laughs> yeah. Of course, we can also say the opposite. Okay, no, no, Durga Devi is supreme. Uh, but then we say everybody is supreme. So uh, Durga Devi is supreme, Shiva is supreme, Vishnu is supreme. We put them all in the same category again. And we elevate them all to the highest level. Also not proper. If we put them on a lower level again, not proper, because they are distinct. Yeah? Vishnu is in one category, David is in another category. Yeah? Uh, so, um, it is very common to take all of these devatas, uh, particularly this, these five forms called uh, Panchopasana, five forms of worship, and uh, we're going to think, oh, well, Vishnu is there, it's very good. But, uh, generally the procedure is to worship them all equally. <coughs> and we're also considering they're not supreme, this jivas. So this is not proper, this is also offensive. <laughs> we can't do that. Uh, so one uh, misconception is that uh, even with the five or more devatas and we're worshiping them, uh, we all consider them to have their own benedictions. We worship Ganesh for some purpose. We worship Shiva for another purpose. We worship Durga for another purpose. And Vishnu for another purpose. So, um, we believe that a uh, specific David uh, can give benedictions that Krishna cannot give. So this is wrong conception again. Uh, 
another conception as well. It's okay, we accept Vishnu Supreme and Shiva and Durga and others are his servants. But anyway, um, since they are servants of the Lord, why can't we just worship them, leave it at that, and then they can worship Vishnu. <laughs> so we can avoid Vishnu, just worship Shiva and Durga, and they can carry the worship up to Vishnu. <laughs> so that's another misconception. <laughs> Uh, so we shouldn't worship, uh, neglect the worship of Vishnu, using such an excuse. Yeah? Another misconception is that ultimately all this worship is illusory, whether it is worship of Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesh, Surya, Dev, or uh, anyone else. Huh? And the, the highest object is impersonal Brahman. <laughs> So, uh, again, this is offensive. <laughs> uh, and everything is Maya, except Brahman. Uh, so, um, as I said, we put Vishnu on the top, David is below, and then we even have Brahman in there. We have Bhagavan, Paramatma, and Brahman as aspects of the Lord. Hmm? But uh, Bhagavan's at the top again, so uh, it's not this impersonal Brahman as the highest entity, it's below Bhagavan. Hmm. Now, so, in, in, in the impersonal conception, often the devatas are worshipped, and Vishnu is worshipped also. But the mistake is that in worshipping these forms, uh, we are advised to give them up ultimately when we reach Brahman. Uh, so therefore they are temporary maya forms only and they're helpful uh, to help us concentrate and get purified but then when we reach a certain level we give up that worship so it's all temporary worship uh, so that's not proper also uh, so what is the proper Vaishnav conclusion or the Siddhanta uh, we accept that uh, uh, the Supreme Lord Vishnu or Krishna has an impersonal aspect also. Brahman does exist. But he also has the personal aspect, Bhagavan. Huh? Of which the personal aspect is actually superior. Hmm? Both exist, uh, being di different and non-different. Huh? Abed, abed. Huh? Uh. And a Supreme Lord, Bhagavan or Krishna or Vishnu, uh, has name, form, qualities and activities, but the name is non-different from the Lord also. It's all spiritual, not material. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the name, because it's non-different from the Krishna, uh, if we chant that name, uh, we can realize Krishna's form, qualities, and activities. Yeah. So it's very, very special. Uh. Hmm. So, uh, uh, we understand the Lord is both impersonal and personal, but of the two, the Bhagavan is the more essential aspect, and Brahman is the uh, secondary aspect, like the light in relation to the sun. Uh, so, um, therefore, the name is very special. It is uh, non-different from the Supreme Lord, and by chanting the name, then we can realize the Lord. Not a problem. Everything is within the name. Like that. And by chanting, we realize Krishna. Hmm. So, what is the proper conduct here? Um, uh, we have Vishnu, we have Devata, etc. Um, the Vaishnava worships the Supreme Lord. We can worship the Devatas as the servants of the Lord. But they're not supreme. They're not independent. Huh? So we can worship Vishnu and we can offer the prasad uh, uh, to the devatas. We can worship them by offering the prasad of the Lord. Huh? And we understand that by doing so, the devatas will be satisfied. Huh? Uh, so we have a clear conception of the independent nature of the Supreme Lord with the devatas being dependent. Uh, so in that sense, we can worship them, but with the proper understanding. Hmm. So though we 
uh, uh, especially the householders, uh, they don't reject the Varnashram system, so they follow the rules of Varnashram. But then um, some of these rules are contrary to bhakti, so we can avoid those. So the worship of the David, as he said, we avoid. And we just worship Vishnu or Krishna. Um, uh, we, we don't off, uh, accept the prasadam offered to the devatas, because usually it's offered to them directly. If it's offered to Vishnu first and then given to the devatas, yes, we can accept that. But if it's offered directly to the, uh, the devatas, then we don't accept that prasadam. Yeah. Uh, th though uh, we put the, put the devatas in a lower position, we do not um, criticize them. Uh, and this is also there in Lord Chaitanya's teachings. <laughs> he, t he tells everyone, don't criticize Shiva. <laughs> uh, so we don't criticize the devatas, the scriptures that are the scriptures that promote their worship, whatever. We, we respect them because they are also devotees of the Supreme Lord. And they have their particular service to perform. Uh, so we don't criticize them in any way. At the same time, we do realize they are in a different position. Yeah. Yeah. So we respect them as servants of the Lord. So what happens if we commit this offense of thinking they're equal? Then we have to repent for our action and get proper knowledge. Yeah. Uh, and then generally, if we have that knowledge, we won't commit this offense. Yeah. And again, we uh, take shelter of the holy name and chant. This gets rid of this particular offense. Mm. Okay, any question there? Well, you were talking about um, you know, Sadhu Ninda. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, when you hear in the class, it's like a very, uh, looks like a black and white, you know, clear cut definition. But in real life, it's there are many shades of gray. For example, um, we say that to hear a devotee, somebody talking bad about other devotees is an offense. Mm -hmm. But then uh, we see that sometimes the senior devotees, they criticize the junior devotees when they have a particular attachment or when they have a particular problem. Mm -hmm. so how do we perceive this? How do we, how do we understand it? Or how do we act, react to that situation? Mm. So when we talk about criticism, um, uh, what this means is uh, fault finding uh, with no particular purpose. <laughs> if we are trying to correct a person, there's not a problem. If there's an actual, you know, mistake or whatever, that's not that's not an operat. Uh, uh, but if there is, uh, let's say, uh, uh, bringing out, pointing out mistakes with no for no benefit at all. Uh, uh, simply to disturb the person or make them feel bad or whatever, then that's considered not good. You know? So we have to look at the intention behind whatever we're doing. Yeah? Um, and um, uh, in, in the process of devotion, obviously, uh, people do have faults that have to be corrected. And then somebody has to help them correct it. So the, the senior, the, the, the Madhyamadikari will correct the Kanishta. <laughs> that's not considered a fault also. But it has to be done in the proper way, that's all. Huh? Because when the Sadhu so we shouldn't, again, judge the senior devotee, then that also will become a offense. Yeah, well, um, if there is some doubt about uh, the, the purpose of the criticism or whatever, then we should consult with somebody else, okay. <laughs> another senior or whatever, <laughs> if there's some confusion, you know. Okay. Yeah. So Maharaj, uh, in the Bhagavad Gita, it says that the devotee should First offense. Uh, so, so, in the, so in that one, like at least the three points which I saw was related to attachment to women or um, uh, yes, or sangha. Uh, yeah, in control of the husband. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm just trying to understand why um, the association of a woman or the woman being in control or that is being seen as a asat sangha. Asat sangha. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, in other words, we're, we're defining who is asat. Eh? 
what is the wrong association? Uh, so obviously we know that uh, materialists and sinful people or whatever like that. Uh, so that's a problem. So if a man associates with a woman who's not his wife, that cannot lead to a lot of problems. <laughs> so therefore that's not considered asat. <laughs> huh? Or if you associate with a person who is also doing that, <laughs> it can lead to you're doing that same thing. <laughs> uh, and then the other one is that uh, it, it, so what, when you're married, then that's not considered asad in itself. Uh, now, if if the if the husband is under the control of the wife, and the wife isn't a devotee, then that's going to be considered asad sangha. <laughs> it's not it's not operating in the proper way again. <laughs> so, but then, if the wife is a devotee. Uh, Still, the man should have some authority in the house. <laughs> Otherwise, what is he? He'll take care of the kids all day. Maharaj, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, in one of the slides, you mentioned the qualities of Madhyamadikari. Yeah. And, uh, and they were like, I think seven to eight different qualities. So, mm -hmm. are there like different categories within Madhya in the sense like, it looks like someone who has summoned the gyan, but he may not be chanting like Shuddha right? Dham. So, so if partial qualities are there, so where do we put him like Kanishka? Oh, well, we can say that um, uh, the Kanishta is one who does not appreciate devotees. He worships the Lord in the temple doesn't appreciate devotees, consequently he doesn't really know the difference between Shiva and Vishnu and whatever and all this, you know. So it's more or less we say it's a mixed type of bhakti he can be doing. Huh? The Madhyama has that understanding of who's Krishna, who's Vishnu, who's Devata, etc., Jiva, etc. He knows the process of pure bhakti. So that much. <laughs> he should be to be a Madhyama. He may not have uh, all the anartas removed or whatever. Uh, he may be not chanting full rounds or partial rounds or whatever. It may not be up to the standard, but still, he's in a better position because at least he has the knowledge uh, of what pure bhakti is, whereas the Kanishtas doesn't even respect devotees, so he doesn't get any knowledge. Yeah? Uh, but, so within the Madhyam, I'll have a wide variety, all the way to Bhajana Kriya, Anartan Dabriti, Nisha Ruchi, and Asakti, and into Bhava. That's all Madhyam Adhikari. <laughs> So, you know, in a lot of families or traditions, um, the family has a guru who gives initiation to children, even though they're like eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're initiated into worshiping that family. Yeah, that family yeah. Is demigod, it could be yeah, a yeah. certain form of Vishnu. Yeah. But then after some time they come to Iskwan and then yeah. they take initiation. Then yeah. If they take initiation in Iskand, is, yeah. it, is it enough? Yeah. So, so there's a rule that if you have a cool guru, <laughs> which means the family guru, <laughs> uh, who's, who's not a genuine Vaishnava, uh, then it's not an offense to give him up to get a genuine Vaishnava guru and, and take initiation from him. So you can do that. That's, that's, that's definitely mentioned in the scripture. <laughs> so it's non-Vaishnava, then it's not a problem. If he's a bona fide Vaishnava, then it's a little problematic. <laughs> So even though they like they don't have that knowledge, but at a very young age they were given a yeah, 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 yeah. or a, a mantra yeah. chant or all those yeah, things. Yeah. Even then, it is uh, if it, if the guru is a Vaishnava guru. No, if it's a Vaishnava, it's no problem. Then you, then you can accept that and whatever. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think though that generally um, that may happen. Maybe in the uh, Vallabha Sampradaya, perhaps. It wouldn't happen in the Madhva Sampradaya, I don't think. And be rare in the Sri Vaishnava. They wouldn't give children initiation, I don't think, in Sri Vaishnava's Sampradaya, um, do they? The property they do in Sri Vaishnava, they do very young uh, They, they do. do. Like, uh, uh, is that considered initiation, though? Uh, some consider it as proper. It, it, like, you couldn't make a blanket statement about it, but in some cases, yes. Some cases, yes. Oh, he does. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. But the, 
you, you could be that the, the child is very young. Yeah. So they take initiation without yeah. really having the intent to surrender to that group. Oh, okay. uh -huh. Or it could also be that mm. even they're older than that, but they just take initiation because it's a family tradition. Their parents uh -huh. wanted them to do it. Uh -huh. so they technically uh -huh. take initiation from a bona fide Vaishnava. Uh -huh. And then later they come to his school okay. and they realize, no, I want to okay. make a lot of yeah. What, what do they do? Well, technically, they, they, they don't have to give up that. Huh? They can do everything within ISKCON, the philosophies there, whatever, whatever is that, as long as that guru doesn't start causing problems and object to everything and make a problem in his life, you know, then, then it wouldn't be a problem. Huh? The only thing, to, he wouldn't get the Diksha mantras, so uh, he would have to worship the deities with his own uh, Vishnu mantras, that's all. Uh, on the same lines, like um, we see that in this call, when you have to uh, take initiation, we have to like read certain number of books and we need to have certain understanding and all. Mm. But at other places, sort of, um, similar, um, we example that Prabhu just gave, like the kids are given initiation at young age and all those mm. things. How do we understand the difference here? Are there actually any qualifications required to get initiated or? Is it just a misconstruction? Well, yeah, yeah, it's different in different places, obviously. But I would think in any case, the, the, the general standard, at least you have some faith in the process. Otherwise, what's the use of getting initiation? You don't have faith in anything. <laughs> but I would assume that even if they were children, because the whole family is like that, they, they would say the faith was like that also. So they would assume they would be faithful and then they would give them initiation. But as far as knowledge, then that's also important. But uh, so in ISKCON, we put more emphasis upon that knowledge that you should have some proper knowledge uh, to go along with it before. Usually it goes afterwards. <laughs> then they get that knowledge afterwards. But we, we insist on some knowledge before also. Mm -hmm. uh, Mara, during one of the slides, we were spoken about Danny God and I said that. Um, they should still be respected because mm. of the vision. And then I think further down it said that demigods have a form both in the material and spiritual world. Mm -hmm. um, could you just elaborate a little on that? Because the other side of it is that, you know, we also learn that even we can become demigods if we have enough punya or if we yeah. perform devotional service. So in that case, if someone performed devotional service, became a demigod in their next life, does that automatically they have a form in the spiritual world now as well. As a devata? Yeah. Oh, not necessarily. Uh, so in Nectar Devotion there, uh, under Dasya Rasa, Rupa Goswami says, one type of Dasya Rasa is the devatas. <laughs> so they actually have a rasa with the Lord, in, in, you know, like this. Uh, however, we know that the devatas in the material world are more or less like sadhakas. They have material bodies and whatever like that. But there's also, in Vaikuntha, there are devatas also who act as servants of Vishnu. Uh, so we have like around Vaikuntha, there's the Dik Devatas who protect the directions. Uh, so we have Shiva in one direction, and Ganesh in somewhere else, and Surya Dev here like this. Uh, so we have all these Devatas there, but there they have spiritual bodies, obviously. And they're all, you know, servants just like uh, Vishnu Dutas and whatever like that. So, oh, so you're saying the expansions of some of them well, no, which is not an actual expansion because they're all just jivas, but some jivas take the role of devatas in the spiritual world and serve the Lord there in Vaikuntha. And then we have devatas in the material world who are jivas who are appointed by the Lord to do certain things here. Uh, one more question. Like, uh, we mentioned about the Sadhu Nita and uh, how serious is that, but since our mind is very unstable of flickering, we might. Uh, do it unknowingly or intentionally. Mm -hmm. How do we you know, avoid that? Because sometimes just thoughts will come into our mind. Yeah. Uh, we are not intentionally thinking it. Yeah. But uh, and that that will actually create a sadhu in our mind. So mm -hmm. we pray to the Lord that you know don't let it happen to me. Or yeah, we can pray like that. And of course, uh, if we practice uh, bhakti sincerely. 
with a humble attitude, understanding the position of Vaishnavas, etc., respecting all living entities, and especially Vaishnavas, uh, then we're less, we're less likely to commit such an offense, you know, if we have proper attitude. We are talking about the uh, how uh, we should not equate uh, Vishnu to the other devatas, mm -hmm. uh, and we should not equate the Vishnu to uh, Shiva, Durga, uh, Ganesha, and, uh, Surya Dev, and then and then also the aspect that uh, um, they, uh, they they are they are coming from Brahma, and then. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is this exactly what Shankaracharya was uh, uh, propounding as the uh, as Mayavada philosophy? Is that the actual thing that Shankaracharya was uh, saying? Well, yeah. Well, Shankaracharya says ultimately, Brahman is real. Everything else is false. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, you can worship Vishnu or Devatas, but then you give it up okay. before liberation. Otherwise, you can't get liberated. <laughs> so they're means to an end, and they're material. Uh, uh, then we have the smarta conception, where the Panchapasana comes in, yeah. which can turn into that also, because some smartas are also my bodies. <laughs> uh, uh, but they may worship devatas, they may have the conception like the karma mimamsakas. That doesn't matter what's this Brahman, that we don't care about that, but we just have devatas and we worship the devatas and we go to Svargaloka. <laughs> and then we get our material desires fulfilled. So we don't think of anything higher than devatas and we just worship different devatas for material reasons. And we also say that the, um, so, so even within that five, let's say somebody is attracted to only to Vishnu, they're not mm. uh, doing worship of the other uh, other four. Uh, so uh, in, in Bhagavatam also we, we say that um, you know, irrespective of whatever your desire, yeah. or if you worship uh, Vishnu, then everything else is. So would that person turn from being a Mayavadi to uh, Krishna Bhakta? It would depend on association. Okay. Yeah, if they don't get association, then they'll continue in a muddle. <laughs> you know? Either they'll just, you know, worship if they go to Brahman or get material benedictions or whatever, you know. Yeah? So they have to get proper guidance and proper knowledge. Mercy of devotees. All right. Uh, in continuation of Aniruddha Prabhu's question. Um, so we say, I don't know whether I've heard this, but I don't know whether any script, there is a scriptural reference to it, that, um, you know, the offense in the mind is not as bad as an offense to a word, and that's not as bad as a physical mm -hmm. offense. And then in Kali Yuga, generally, the mind offenses are for yeah. you know, not taken. So is that a correct statement? Uh, well, yeah, a mind is less uh, less serious when they're then vocal, and uh, that, that's okay. I haven't seen it say it scripturally, but it's logical. As for in Kali Yuga, the mind doesn't, I haven't seen that in scripture also. <laughs> uh, but um, usually if it's in the mind and we don't control it, then it eventually becomes verbal and action or whatever like that. So we do have to be careful even what's in the mind. I've also heard devotees extend that last step further and say that even if it is true that in Kali Yuga um, mental offenses aren't taken as seriously, yeah. devotees are supposed to be ideal, so they're counted according to the standard of Satya Yuga. So that oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Well, as I said, uh, if it's mental, uh, we have to be careful because if it, if it stays there, then it's going to eventually come out in physical form. So we do have to curb it in, in the in the initial state. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, if somebody has a mental face towards something, looking towards something, is it better to? Um, Avoid that association, be with people only where we are not even doing mentally, 
uh, and associate with those type of devotees? Uh, well, um, uh, are you considering this to be uh, actually an offense, like, like or? I think, I think like you no, know, I'm you know I, when I associate with uh, someone, I'm seeing a fault in someone. Okay. And that person is not in a position where they can accept the fault, so yeah, it's yeah. not good to give anything. And yeah. You know, so maybe better not to associate with them in that yeah, case, yeah, because I'm you know. Yeah. 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 Really open to them and. Yeah, yeah, can do that. Maharaj, this is, there's a question online. Um, Hi Krishna Danda Pranam Maharaj, I have a question. What is the ideal action or mindset to have when someone hears a criticism of a devotee? Uh, well, in general, we shouldn't take criticism. But I'm saying it, it depends on the intention also. Uh, and it depends on what it is, like uh, uh, some may be simply um, reporting a mistake or something like that, or uh, something that may be serious that has to be dealt with. So we don't consider that to be the criticism. The criticism is to uh, see a fault which may not be there, or it even may be, that may be there, but we're trying to use it with wrong intentions. Then it would be criticism. <laughs> Um, then there, uh, another question is, uh, uh, if I feel bad because of someone's action, is it an offense for that person? Oh, in one sense, yes, but uh, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, in the story of Sanatan Goswami, he laughed. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the, the sadhu out there thought, he's laughing at me. <laughs> and so he got disturbed. And therefore, it's not in Goswami got the effect of the offense because he got he had disturbed the sadhu, even though it wasn't intentional on his part. So then he had got disturbed in his bhajan because of that. So it can be very subtle. Yeah. Well, going back to the point of intention of understanding the intention with which a devotee is criticizing others. Um, we can see everything in a positive light. So, like, you know, even when somebody criticizes somebody, we can, you know, just look at the positive side of it. Mm. And we, we, we may, because we may not understand their intention. Mm. Is that the right thing to do? Or, you know, we have to really go do an investigation and understand the, you know, real intention. Oh, I see. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe if, if it's not, it's not a heavy, heavy uh, thing, then we can we not don't have to take it too seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think you should not. Yeah.